this episode, join Andy and Mandy as they discuss how to stay mentally healthy during these trying times. Welcome to the Road Home from Wrestling. Sort of. Here in my car, I feel safest of all. I can lock all my doors and this the only way to live in cars. All right, folks, welcome to the Road Home from Wrestling. My name's Andy. I'm coming to you live to tape from the world headquarters of the world. And today we are joined by Mandy, who is coming to us from the satellite world headquarters of the world. How are you doing, Mandy? I'm doing great. Glad to be here. Sort of. Yeah? Distance. Well, I, you know, we're going to get into why you're coming on today a little bit. But first of all, are you okay? Like, is everything all right with you? And how are, how are you dealing with all this? I'm doing good because I have a really great support system to help me with Isaac, you know. Um, otherwise, things might be a little bit harder because I'm working a lot, you know, and I'm working from home and my husband's working from home. So if my son were here, too, we wouldn't be able to do homework and he would be by himself the entire time. So I'm lucky to have a support system. Um, but in terms of professionally, um, you know, we haven't, our business has not slowed down. I'll say that it's, it's kind of gotten busier and more intense, kind of heavier, I guess you could say. So my days consist of working and recovering from work and then working and then recovering from work. But that's my job right now. They've sort of called us to do our duties as mental health professionals. Our state board has said that, um, you know, sort of a call to arms. If you're not working, you need to find a placement to be contributing and to be working. So right now my main job is helping people with their mental health and keeping myself mentally healthy. Now, um, the reason that you're talking about all this and why you're on is we've joked around in the past and called you the official mental health professional of the Road Home from Wrestling podcast, which is your official title. That's real. <laughs> but that's also a shoot, right? Uh, you are, uh, you know, you have some credentials and you are a uh, mental health professional. Can you tell us what those are and why we should even listen to a word you say? Yeah, I, it is a shoot. Um, <laughs> this is <laughs> my, my shoot job. Uh, well, so I'm a psychotherapist. Um, my credentials are that I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor. I'm also a supervisor. So I am able to have interns or minions, as nice. you guys might call it. Um, and I'm also a clinically certified domestic violence counselor. And I am a clinically certified mental health counselor through our national board. Um, for mental health. So I've got a bunch of letters after my name, basically. But what it comes down to is I'm, I'm a counselor who um, specializes in treating people who have been abused and helping them um, uh, remove abusive presence from their life, any sort of toxic or abusive presence, how to deal with that, navigate it, um, how to prevent it from happening in the future, and then most importantly, how to heal from it and move forward and have a happy and healthy life after abuse. That's right. Now, We've had you on many times, and if you want to listen to Mandy's input on how babyface wrestlers who have been abused by heel wrestlers can get better and, you know, uh, some of the things that they can do, then, you know, go back through any of our episodes that are listed as beer wrestling. Uh, you're going to have Mandy on there, you know, breaking down all these characters and in, 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 in a fun way. But, you know... That got me to thinking, and as I was thinking, I know a lot of people whose entire livelihood and reason for existing in a lot in some cases has just disappeared. 
And I thought to myself, I know a lot of people like that, and I think that some of them might be in trouble um, with their mental health. I think we all kind of are in a little bit of trouble with our mental health. And so, you know, I figured we'd get you on to answer some questions and to just talk about how to, you know, some practical advice for how to deal with this kind of thing that's going on in the world. So um, what do you have anything that we should get uh, into or get out of the way before we get started into some of these questions? Um, no, let's let's get started. Okay, awesome. So um, I, I kind of some of these questions are um, from real people. You know, some of them are kind of uh, rever- reworded versions of ones that we got in, um, but they are all anonymous. So um, you know, but our first question uh, comes to us from anonymous, and it says, um, "What's the best advice for dealing with a long distance relationship during this whole quarantine thing?" I mean, we got somebody who you know, uh, is dealing with a a situation where they can't see their loved one. And whether that's someone that you are in a romantic relationship with, or that's just a member of your family, you know, uh, how do folks deal with this kind of thing? Well, first, let me answer from the perspective of an intimate partner or romantic relationship. Um, Because I think that, you know, when you're in love with someone and you can't see them, you really miss them in a way that's different than you might be missing other people. Um, You know, you might be missing your boyfriend or your girlfriend and having that sense of sort of like homesickness even um, because you can't, um, you can't see them or perhaps your relationship was just getting started or uh, maybe you just accomplished a relationship milestone of some sort and then blam, the whole world changed and, Um, You know, you thought you were on a course together and now you've been asked to not see each other for an unknown period of time. And so then it puts the the relationship into question even. Um, How are we supposed to do this? And for those, I would say that, you know, get back to the old fashioned stuff. Write love letters and literally put them in the mail to each other. Another thing you can do is hold back communicating in a constant stream all the time, Um, because then if you sort of, I don't know, save that up, then it feels more special every time you do communicate um, and you can sort of be more mindful and present with the other person. If let's say you schedule a phone call for every other day, you know, instead of three times a day, you guys are talking or FaceTiming. Sometimes that isn't good. You know, you think you want to stay connected to the person, but what happens is just the boring monotony of all of this is kind of, I don't know, it takes away that fun romantic part. So, you know, try if you can to put some time between the interactions and then that way they're even more special every time. Another thing that you can do is make lists or notes of things that you think about um, pertaining to your partner or your family member. Um, You know, if I'm thinking of something I need to tell my mom, um, I might go ahead and write that down so that when I get on the phone with her, I can just look at my notes. So often we'll hang up with the call and go, man, I, I really wanted to say this, but I didn't. So be prepared for your interactions ahead of time. Um, another thing would be to find some privacy with your video um, interactions. And, uh, you know, some people are finding intimacy in that way. Um, I'm trying to think of another way to word that. Can you think of a way to word that? <laughs> I'm not sure. I I do know that one way to explain that first thing that you said, as far as um, you know, like let's not let's not only do super kicks in a match, all right? You know, if you only do super kicks and that's your finish, then. Hey, I mean, we've already seen the super kick. So if you're calling your loved one every single day, every second of the day, it doesn't mean anything, you know. And so uh, I really like that spreading that out a little bit as a way to kind of, you know, make those connections and those interactions that you have more meaningful. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and two, keep in mind and, you know, this is something to expect. And you can you can see this in any dynamic, whether it's a familial dynamic or an intimate partner dynamic, that situations like this will do two things. It will magnify and highlight your strengths. 
but it'll also magnify and highlight underlying issues that are unresolved. So if you are missing your partner and you're also noticing some of those unresolved issues surfacing, don't be afraid of that. That's not a sign that your relationship is over or that things aren't going to work out. It's just the universe is saying, hey, here's something you guys might need to talk about or to work on. Um, so don't be afraid of those conflict moments or the icky feeling moments where, you know, something is, is rearing its head. This is a perfect time to face those things head on um, and it will it'll help your relationship in the long run. Another thing you can do is to read a book together like mm. the five love languages, for example, is a great book for couples to read. Um, and you can get that free in huh. an audio version from the library if you don't have the funds. Um, and then, of course, Audible has it, I'm sure. Yeah, and you can get that for free with audibletrial.com slash the road home FW, motherfuckers. So you can <laughs> get that up there, too. Um, yeah. I, I so really you like wanna... it. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, just the last couple things is, you know, to try to find fun games to play that you can play each other, um, Scrabble or, you know, any anything that you can do long distance to play games. And then also um, is be sure that you're using a lot of verbal affirmations because you're not going to physically be able to see this person. And some of us rely on physical touch as a love language or acts of service as a love language. And some of our love languages, they've been, you know, cut off right now. So we might have to rely on a love language that isn't our natural one, but we're going to just need to go ahead and get comfortable with that. So if you're not used to using verbal affirmations with your partner, now's the time to get more comfortable with being able to say things and like actually talk about feelings and stuff. <laughs> I, I think another thing too, and maybe you shouldn't listen to relationship advice from me, but uh, <laughs> just an idea is that try not to focus on the drama of all this. That would just be my suggestion. Um, when I think of relationships I've had when they, when they were, you know, quote unquote, during the good times, it's when we were having fun. When I looked over at that person and we smiled knowingly at each other, it's not when we were arguing over the fact that they were two minutes late to call me or whatever dumbass shit that people find to uh, to argue about. So, you know, I would suggest that you just try to kind of focus on the positive stuff and don't sit there and be woe is me um, on the phone with that person, especially if it is someone that you're, you know, this is you're in an intimate relationship with and you can't see them, you know, savor that time. You know, like you were saying before, make it special. Don't uh, focus on the negative when you do have finally have that opportunity to talk to that person. You think about it like you're dating again. You know, you want to court the person. You want to check on them. And, of course, we want to be genuine and honest with each other. But, you know, things can become imbalanced. It depends on what each of your situations are. Like maybe one of you is quarantined with people that are healthy for you. But another person is quarantined with people that are toxic for them. And so it'll be imbalanced where one person is going to be venting or dumping to the other person all the time with all of their complaints about their circumstances. Well, it's important that you do have somebody that you can talk to about that stuff. Just be careful to not try to turn your partner into a therapist. <laughs> That does not got that does not go well. <laughs> That's a common mistake in relationships, mm -hmm. right? It's 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 common that folks think that, you know, this person you know, that has come home from work or whatever, um, you know, the, they want to hear every single thing that's gone wrong in your day. And and they don't, you know, I mean, unless that's what your relationship is based on. And somehow you figured out a healthy way to do that. Um, you know, that's uh, that's a way to kind of make someone annoyed of you. And this is not the time to be doing that. Um, so, well, that's some good practical advice there, Mandy. And I know you know, I'm here to try to, you know, lighten the mood a little bit, but this is some good shit, people. So, you know, listen to this stuff and and go back and listen again, because something Mandy said in there is very important that, you know, this book, The Five Love Languages that you can get free on audibletrial.com backslash the Red Home FW, you can, um, you know, there's five different ways to communicate your love. So, you know, she's saying that if you're the kind of person who does one of those, then maybe through that book or, you know, some Internet research, you can find the other ways to communicate that love and maybe focus more on those because you can't have the other one. Right. 
Well, yeah. And, you know, b- before we move on to the next question, there was a, there were a couple wrestlers that I was really starting to get worried about on this topic. And one would be the swinger. <gasps> I mean, the swinger is, you know, somebody who definitely needs physical touch um, and interactions with multiple people simultaneously. Um, and so I, you know, for the swinger, look, you know, some of these online platforms will allow for more than one people to join your meeting. Oh. Um, and so perhaps, you know, you could um, continue with a poly lifestyle um, and, and using those online platforms. Get creative. If you're listening um, to us for the first time or something, or you're joining us, uh, the Swinger is a local wrestler here who is tremendous, by the way. Follow him at Swinger Fits on um, uh, Twitter, and he is a good time. And so Mandy's just trying to help everybody here, and she knows that there's a lot of people out there. I mean, like, for example, there's a young wrestler at uh, the Future Stars who his thing is he shakes people's hand. His name's Jimbo. He can't wait to (laughs) shake your hand. Like, the whole match sometimes is him trying to shake your hand, and now he can't, you know? So, I mean, we're actually going to have an interview with him coming up here in a, a week or two, and that's going to address some of these things of how these folks are dealing with, you know, the inability to touch the people around them. So, uh, you know, it's a shame. Mandy, do you ever think, like, there's this big thing in wrestling culture, shaking hands. It's very important. You know, in fact... You, if you are a, you know, a, a young green wrestler and you come into a locker room that's got a bunch of established vets and you don't shake everyone's hand, the second you're out the door, they're all going to be talking shit about you. You may not be booked again on a simple mistake like that. Do you think that the shaking hands culture will ever return to what it used to be? Like in <laughs> life, in wrestling, whatever. You know, I think that we will continue to shake hands, but we might be more selective as to who we shake hands with. <laughs> so the swinger is out, right? We are not shaking <laughs> right. hands. But Jimbo, maybe. Hey, if, maybe if I've got a glove on. <laughs> maybe even double bag it. There you go. <laughs> I would imagine that wrestlers in general um, are really sharing each other's stuff a lot. You know, there's a lot of touching and sweating and spit and bodily fluids being exchanged and you guys are breathing on each other and I'm assuming like rubbing each other down with oil too sometimes um so yeah I mean it, for wrestlers this is just like you said at the beginning there's been a major change for people who um you know are used to having very close contact with others and that's an important part of their life I mean sometimes so close they're inside the other person in the swingers case. So, I mean, you know, it's just a matter of, you know, this physical closeness just can't happen right now. So, but the swinger, you know, he's a swinger. I'm sure he knows about all those love languages. He may have even invented a couple of his own, if you know what I mean. So, um, but our next question is kind of, uh, it's a double-edged sword here, this one, because it's it's a question about physical fitness and mental fitness. How do we, I mean, right now, I'm cooped up in my apartment. I really can't leave. And if I do leave, it's to go to the park or to do something I absolutely have to do. That's it. I, other than that, I'm staying in my home. Um, I personally have no problem staying physical, physically fit. If you've seen me, that's just natural. So I don't even try. Um, but there's a lot of folks out there that may have a problem with something like that. Um, you know, the question is how can folks stay physically fit while they're in a home, you know, or stuck in home and how can they stay mentally fit as well? And I don't mean mentally healthy. I mean, you know, sharp. Is some people that are like me, I'm stuck in my house by myself. If I wasn't talking to you, I'd be playing video games, getting dumber and dumber by the second. <laughs> so how can folks stay, stay mentally sharp and physically sharp? Well, for mental sharpness, you're going to need to have good sleep. And you want to try to keep a good sleep routine. Some of us are getting really lax in our sleep schedule, and that's just not good for your brain overall. Um, So you want to try to continue to have healthy sleep patterns and think about your sleep environment. Is it too hot? Is it too cold? Are there noises that are waking you up? Um, Is there someone that snores? Um, Are there people in your house that don't respect that you're sleeping? I find that is true in a lot of households where, you know, if someone's sleeping, everyone should probably be quiet or at least try to. Um, 
you know, unless that person just sleeps all the time, you know, but if someone is tired and they need a nap, then the household should respect that and try to be quiet while somebody takes their nap. It's like a baby. If the baby's sleeping, you'd be quiet, right? So an adult would be the same way. So just make sure you're, you're getting some good sleep. Your brain really likes that. Do you think, do you think that we could do this? Like if you're out there and you're having problems sleeping and, you know, I don't know if this guy would be worth, you know, would would want to do this. But I think that Muldoon, the wrestler from NWF, could really make some money just, you know, Skyping with his people <laughs> and talking to them because he's so boring. They'll just instantly <laughs> fall asleep. Some good advice, right? Right, right. So the, another thing you can do is, I don't know, some people really like the asthma um, videos on YouTube, uh, ASMR. And if you find the right video, sometimes that can be very relaxing um, for sleep. Also, you can have white noise um, apps on your phone um, to try to drown out some exterior noise that might be waking you up. So just examine your sleep habits and your sleep environment and just make sure that it is conducive to a healthy sleep life. Um, So your brain really needs rest and sleep. Another thing that you might want to think about is what you're ingesting mentally. Um, It's time at some point to turn off the news. We don't need to have a 24-7 stream of catastrophic information coming in. It doesn't help. It doesn't make you more armed. It doesn't make you more informed. All it does is keep your brain in that fight-flight mode at all times. And, um, you know, so we need to have a diverse diet of media where we're watching funny things. We're watching entertaining things that are, you know, exciting or possibly educational. (gasps) Um, I know. Right. Uh, You know, and so if you're sitting playing Call of Duty 12 hours a day, that's not good for you. It's not because the video game is bad. It's just your brain and your body needs more than that. Um, so if you're addicted to a video game, I feel you have been there too. Um, but try if you can to just make a variety for your brain because it needs to be fed, you know, and it needs to be taken care of. So staying mentally healthy means just that, um, in terms of how to take care of your brain, but also your thought life and what are the things that you're thinking about? We're going to talk more about that in a second, I would imagine, but for the physical, might be more than a second, but yeah, yeah, probably. Physical fitness. Okay, so you guys, I know that you're going to roll your eyes at me, and I know you're tired of hearing about it, but it's 100% factually true that yoga does both. Yoga helps your brain, and it helps your body. And for you big tough guys out there that are used to doing like choke slams and shit like that, (laughs) you're thinking like yoga, that's for old ladies or that's for women or that's for tree huggers or something. Um, But I challenge you, I challenge you to find a um, intermediate level yoga um, routine on YouTube and I challenge you to make it through from beginning to end. And you tell me at the end if yoga is easy or hard. And, well, I, and it's it's hard. And Mandy, it, do, you, mm-hmm. do you know about DDP? Do you know who that is? DDP. Yeah, Diamond Dallas Page. He's a oh. very, very famous wrestler who has come out with this, uh, this thing called DDP yoga. It's been around for years. And it's, quote, unquote, not your mama's yoga. It's <laughs> four people who think yoga is stupid. All right. right. He every single uh, one of his exercises, uh, which he has hundreds of them, uh, exercise programs and stuff like that. It has uh, a way that you can do it seated. You can do it at an intermediate intermediate level. You can do it at a difficult level and everything in between. So he has a way that you can do it even if you're you can't walk. You can still do his yoga all the way up to some of the hardest stuff that you can get. And so he has a he has a, a meal program and all that kind of stuff. He has his own app. I'm sure right now I would assume he's offering some kind of deal. Uh, that's something I've been planning on getting on for a long time. But I mean, I don't really need it. So, you know, it's just kind of wasted money for me. But, you know, for <laughs> other folks, it may be something to look into. I'm sure other folks have heard of that. 
Well, that brings me to my next point in that you've got to find the style of yoga that's right for you. So, for example, for me, I really like that old school yoga where we're doing mindful meditation beforehand and it's a very peaceful and serene environment. Um, But other people like to do yoga that's more challenging with uh, it's more like a gym style yoga, you know, um, where we're not necessarily focusing on the meditative pieces. Um, But I think that you'll be really surprised um, how much yoga can do for you if you really truly adopt it as being part of your routine. It's very helpful for your mind and for your body. Other ways for you to stay healthy physically are the stuff, it's the stuff you're seeing and hearing already. You know, get out and take a walk once a day if you can. Um, You can still do push-ups and sit-ups. I'm sure a bunch of you have like your chin-up bars somewhere in your house in the doorway (laughs) or the basement or, you know, I'm sure you already have something physical that you can do at home. But open up your mind a little bit and try some different things. And hey, you know what women really like? They like a man that does yoga. And if you're trying to keep that relationship alive, you guys could do yoga together, but separately. Wow. And that's, yeah, you're tying it all together here. So this is not only practical advice, but this is like double practical advice. I love it. I love it. That's awesome. Well, okay. So um, the next question is is another, you know, similar one to that, but it's different. This is about routines. So, you know, a lot of us get in routines, all of us, you know, for the most part, and, and we do things in a certain order every day. And, and some people thrive on that. I know that I personally am the kind of person where if I get out of my routine of waking up early, for example, that's one routine thing that I do, no matter what, it really screws me up for like a week. You know, if I really so like, for example, last night, I didn't go to bed till three in the morning. I still got up at six just because that's how my brain works, because it's just that's the way it works. So, you know, I might take a a nap this afternoon or something like that. But, you know, my point is, is that people are on these established routines, routines. And I find in my life that when I get knocked off of those routines, that's when I'm in trouble mentally. And what I mean is, is I'm in, in, in danger of making poor decisions. I'm in danger of um, setting up new routines that are unhealthy and various other things that can happen to me. How can folks kind of continue to establish these, you know, routines that are continue these pre-established routines? Excuse me. Well, something that I am an expert um, in is self-care and establishing routines and maintaining routines of self-care. And I'm also, I'm also an expert on behavior change, how to change behaviors to healthier behaviors um, and how to you know, shift certain behaviors in a different direction. So um, what we're talking about is a routine of self-care that you can establish and maintain and possibly adopting or curbing some existing uh, or, or, or some healthy behaviors. And And, you know, I guess for a lot of guys, it's like gym, tan, laundry. (laughs) There's got to be like a protein shake in there somewhere. That's part of gym. That's part of gym. Okay, that goes with gym. I mean, you know, gym is uh, one umbrella. You know, tan Mm -hmm. is another and laundry is another because, I mean, Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that there's waxing going on with the tanning. I don't know. I'm not (laughs) from Jersey Shore, so. (laughs) Yeah, and and so for for a lot of people, like for me, my routine is super important. And then of course we have Isaac who loves routine, um, and that's all just been blown to shit recently. <laughs> um, and and it it makes us feel very disoriented and kind of lost. And some people get anxious, or some people get depressed, or if somebody has PTSD, they might feel kind of just triggered by you know um, the unknown, not having that you know, reliable thing that you know is going to happen next can really start to um, bug people that deal with depression, anxiety, or trauma. Um, But here's what we need to do to create and maintain a routine of self-care. And gym, tan, laundry, we'll just say that self-care. You know, when you go to the gym, take care of yourself. You're going to the tan to look sexy or highlight your muscles or whatever that you do that for. Um, And then, of course, laundry. Now, you know, with the laundry, I'm assuming that's like what wrestling gear they're washing (laughs) like the or does that get washed? 
Oh, absolutely, yes. It's, it, it you don't wash that in the washing machine, though, unless you're an idiot. Oh, so so hand-washing. Yeah, that's full light in the tub, uh, mm-hmm. hand-washed, and then, you know, dried properly. So. I have a feeling there's a bunch of women that actually do all of that. Oh. The unsung heroes that are actually the ones that are hand-washing some uniforms. I don't know. That's funny. Do they wash their own uniforms, or do they let their girlfriends do it? It's, it's called ring gear, first of all. Oh, and, uh, sorry. <laughs> Gear, gear. Well, I would assume that if if a young man is married, uh, an old man, whoever they are, that and they have something worked out with their wife where she does the laundry, then yes, if they have a girlfriend and that's the same situation or any gender exchange within there, mm-hmm. I, I I don't think that you're talking about everybody. You know, I think okay. there's a lot of people who don't ever wash their gear, Mandy. Did oh you? no. Yes, that's a thing. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's not taking care of yourself <laughs> or anyone else that has right. to come in contact with it. Okay, seriously, though. So when you want to create and maintain a routine of self-care, you want to schedule and plan, of, plan ahead. So literally get out your phone, get out the calendar on your phone, and set times up for your activities in advance. And then you start planning your life around those activities. And that's one way of establishing it is that you're working it into whatever is happening already by looking down the road a week or two weeks. So let's say and, you know, I want to start do I want to start learning Spanish. Well, there's no way I'm going to actually do that if I don't make myself do it. So I might go onto my calendar and say next week, starting Monday um, at noon, from noon to 12, from 12 to 12, 15, this is what I'm doing. And then it pops up on my phone and reminds me, this is what you're supposed to do. So use technology and scheduling ahead of time. Um, Another thing is you want to make it super doable. Don't set lofty goals. That's just going to set yourself up to feel like crap when you don't succeed. Make it a doable thing that you will do well. um, And then if you do it well and you master it, you know, then you can ratchet it up to something more difficult. But start with stuff that's super easy and super doable. And what I mean by that, it could be something like drink a glass of water in the morning. You know, it, it could be something like go to bed 15 minutes early. It doesn't have to be some big monumental thing. It can be just little tiny changes that you want to add to your life um, that once they're done for a period of time is going to enhance your life. Also, oh, I was going to say go it alone because that's one that I usually say, but we don't have to worry about that, right? <laughs> um, for people who rely on other people for their routines, um, especially with the gym or with diets, you know, some of those things we need to go it alone. Um, but for in terms of behavior change, what we want to do is we want to try something for 14 days. And after 14 days, we'll know if it's a good fit for us. Then once we establish that it's a good fit, we want to try to do it for 90 days. And then at the end of 90 days is when you'll be able to see um, major results um, and how effective your method is. Um, But make lists and reminders and think about your whole self when you're develop when you're developing your routine. Make sure that you're uh, saving time for your physical self, even hygiene stuff. A lot of people aren't doing hygiene because we're all home, um, but you still got to do hygiene because it's good for you. It's good for your body. It's good for your mental health. So take a hot shower, you know, um, trim your nails and your toenails, do all the things you need to do to take care of your body and lower your expectations, lower your expectations of of what you're going to be able to accomplish, especially during a fucking pandemic. <laughs> it's, you know, we're not going to be able to move mountains right now. So let's just think about this week. You know, let's just think about this small thing that we'd like to establish. Um, and then another one, and wrestlers might have a hard time with this, is keep it to yourself. Meaning <laughs> you don't have to, you don't have to like cut a promo. You don't have to cut a promo about your new routine that you're doing, your self care routine. You don't have to announce it on Facebook or announce it to your family. You know, just do it. You don't have to tell everybody that you're doing it. What is it that um, 
Dean you know, said. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so co-host Dean was on keto and we had this joke where, you know, you don't lose, you don't start losing weight on keto until you tell everyone. So, you know, <laughs> you have to tell them, otherwise you can't lose weight. That's part of it. And I would, I would um, uh, submit that if you start a new behavior on your own and you don't tell anybody, that kind of behavior is going to like stick with you more than anything else you did with anybody else. And that's me personally. That's how I am. I know a lot of people are like that as well. Or some people have never tried that. And, and I mean, if you start doing something that you find to work for you with, with, you know, health or any of the stuff we're talking about, some new behavior that you love, some new video game, some new thing that you're doing, some new exercise, don't tell anybody. Like, keep it to yourself. It's your little secret with yourself. And it's a fun little game. You know, when that comes up in conversation, you can't talk about it. And then after time, it's a part of you. And then you can share it with other people because it's already in there. You know, you don't need their, their you know, uh, approval to do this thing. You've already done it. Exactly. And and then that way, if you know what, you get to the end of that 14 days and it's not for you, you didn't already go around telling everybody that you're doing this. It gives you the opportunity to change your mind, to not feel like crap, you know. And then I guess, you know, that that is that go it alone thing. Keep it to yourself is that if you include other people, um, it invites their input. Um, they say negative things to talk you out of it. Um, they'll say, oh, I want to do that, too. Can I do it with you? And then you wind up having this other person now in the mix. So, you know, use this time to have some privacy in terms of your plans for yourself um, and your your self-care, what you're doing for your own mental and physical fitness. If somebody notices that you've been really happy lately or you're looking kind of fit and they're like, wow, you're looking good. What are you doing? Then you then you can say, well, here's what's worked for me. Here's mm-hmm. what I've tried. Um, and here's here's how it's been successful. Here's how it was challenging. Um, and so wait for someone to reach out and say, what you been doing? You you seem different. I'm like, yeah, I am different because I've been doing A, B, C and D. Um, yeah. And then and then uh, lastly, for this topic, since I actually have a lot of information on it, is remember that it's trial and error. So you're going to do some stuff that don't doesn't work out. And that's OK. That's how it goes. So, you know, it's OK to try a few different things until you find the right thing and anticipate it to be a little bit stressful. Just because something's a little bit stressful at first doesn't mean that it's not the right choice. So getting into the lotus position for the first time is going to be challenging for some of you guys. And, you know, if you get frustrated with that right away, then you might give up on it. Although I think a lot of wrestlers probably don't give up that easy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you've become a wrestler, you yeah. failed a lot. It, you know, and I don't, <laughs> I don't mean, I mean, it doesn't matter who you are. I don't care who you are unless you're Kurt Angle or something like that. You are going to screw up your first bump and you're going to hit your head and you're going to accidentally, you know, yeah. hurt somebody else. And these kinds of things happen in wrestling uh, for everybody. It's not just mm-hmm. one person. Um, so they're so- used to, um, having to do things many, many times to get it right and to not lose faith in yourself um, that you, you won't accomplish it. It just might take some time. Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. And we all we all sucked at everything when we first started. So that's another <laughs> thing people tend to forget is they see somebody do something. They go, oh, he makes it look so easy. Well, that's not how things were originally. So, you know, it's just the way it is. But uh, so you, And then if it's something that, you have done that is doing things for you that's positive you wake up one day and you're like oh, I don't want to do it that means you definitely need to do it mm. so when you get that feeling of I'm going to skip it that's when you got to kick it into gear and make sure that you definitely do it then you know insist upon it and what I mean by that is that whoever's in your household whoever you're quarantined with they need to understand what's important to you what you need to be a happy and healthy person and then, you know, politely, respectfully insist upon those things. Um, and so then that way you're not letting other people sort of stomp all over your needs. Uh, and then, you know, practice mindfulness. This is a really, really great time for, for practicing mindfulness. Um, and mindfulness is just basically a non judgmental attention to the present moment where you're basically just sitting in the moment with yourself, observing yourself in an objective and non-judgmental way. 
And um, mindfulness can really be super helpful um, when we're trying to clear our head to figure out what it is that we even want to try doing. Okay, that's pretty good stuff. I like it. This is kind of out of nowhere, too. Um, or not out of nowhere to also out of nowhere. It is out of nowhere. And that is uh, some advice that I would give just as kind of some cool stuff. Is it because I've gotten a few messages from people I haven't talked to in a while just saying, hey, how you doing? You know, is everything OK? I really like that. That made me feel good. You know, I was like, OK, yeah, this person's thinking about me. I mean, and you know what I did is I passed that on. And and then I, I messaged a bunch of people that I hadn't talked to in a little bit just to check on them. And I'm going to keep doing that while we're while we're here. I have a long list of people that I haven't talked to in a while, as we all do. And I recommend you reach out to those folks just to say, hey, um, and that's not for your you know, edification. That's for theirs. You know, that's for them to feel a little better. And, and uh, you know, that's one thing. Other thing you can do is that, you know, if you have a friend who's wants lunch, you could always order them pizza and have it delivered. I mean, there's some nice things that we could do for folks, too, uh, while we're all cooped up as well. Right. Mm-hmm. All right. Awesome. So our next topic and or question deals with isolation and how that can cause um, anxious thoughts and uh, some anxious behavior as well. Uh, this person writes in and says, uh, you know, in times of isolation, I find it very easy to think about what would be easier or what if scenarios. And they often lead to more destructive mindset. I mean, I think this person means uh, anxious thoughts about you know, uh, taking the easy way on something or, for example, you know, just having these what if scenarios, like they said, uh, in their mind, kind of running things through their mind over and over again. And this person says, that if, is there a way um, or a suggestion to limit these times, these things in your mind when you're alone all the time? Well, yeah. And I, I just mentioned mindfulness. Mindfulness is a free coping tool that you practice and use and it goes with you everywhere you are doesn't require an app or a therapist um, but it definitely does take practice and that's one way we can step outside of ourselves and we notice ourselves with this sort of outside awareness and actually that awareness or you know your ability to be conscious of yourself or watch yourself that's actually you that's your that's your energy. That's your spirit. Your brain is literally an organ, just like your stomach or your heart. And, you know, because we've been raised in Western culture, we were never taught this concept. We were taught, I am my thoughts. So our stream of consciousness is who we think we are. And that's that that verbal, um, whether it's conversational, um, but that stream of thought that you have going through your mind every day, we've been taught that that's who we are, which isn't true. What that is, is it's your brain working and doing its job. Thoughts are the result of your brain working. And so therefore, thoughts are no more meaningful than farts. <laughs> Hey, come on now. Wait a second. Yeah. You, I mean, farts are meaningful, Mandy. I mean, they, they <laughs> My, mean our lot. farts are meaningful. Yes. <laughs> yes that a lot. In our family history, farts are a big deal. So I think you need to find a different metaphor for that. But well, you know, I'll let the, it slide. the point that I'm making is that your brain is an organ. And it has a job to do. It keeps you alive. It helps you be creative. It um, it helps you pro want to procreate, keep the human race going. You know, there's a lot of things that our brain does for us. Um, but it is an organ just like your heart or your stomach. And if you ate a burrito and were gassy, you're not beating yourself up about that. I'm like, I'm not sitting there going like, well, I'm a terrible person because I'm gassy. I ate a burrito. <laughs> no. No, you're, you're, text, you're texting me going, I just farted. Yeah. It, it smells. <laughs> I just it's awesome. nasty. It's very <laughs> off. But, but what we have learned in Western culture is that we overly identify with our stream of consciousness. So when our thoughts take a turn, it really can derail us. But truly, that's all they are our thoughts. And we have many, 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 many thoughts a day. Okay. So I could have just thought about a purple dragon and it's gone already. I, you know, it just passed and went and went. Right. But if I had a phobia of purple dragons and the thought of purple dragon came into my mind, I'm going to give that a lot of attention and I'm going to assign a lot of meaning. 
And what people generally don't understand is that we can choose which thoughts we pay attention to and how much meaning that we assign to them. So, for example, um, I might wake up one day and just be feeling really fucking angry all day. And I'm going to start probably um, focusing in on my husband as the cause (laughs) of my anger, right? So, but because I practice mindfulness, I'm able to step outside of myself and say, okay, you are feeling angry. That means my body's feeling angry. My chest is a little tight. My adrenaline's going. It might be a little sweaty. Um, And I got a vein in my forehead popping out. And then from that feeling, we now we have thoughts that we're putting with it. And those thoughts will be anything in our immediate vicinity. It could be the noise that's bothering me. It could be that asshole that cut me off. It could be my husband who trashes the kitchen 14 times a day. You know, he cooks like he's fucking outdoors. He <laughs> cooks like we're outside. Like, what are you doing? His food's really good, though, and he it's does a delicious. great job. And the second I take a bite, I'm all better, and then I'm not mad anymore. Because, <laughs> because, that 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 physical part of, of like actually, you know, hangry, right? You have food, you feel better. It's affecting your brain. The brain mm-hmm. is in charge, right? So but if you practice mindfulness, I can step outside of myself and say, I'm feeling angry today. Oh, right. I had way too much caffeine. I didn't sleep well um, and I haven't been doing my self-care. So that's why I'm feeling angry Um, And then, oh, well, and move on and try to be better, not assign a lot of meaning to it. You just notice it in a nonjudgmental way and move forward. So mindfulness, if you can get on um, YouTube or Google mindfulness and just like with the yoga, mindfulness has all kinds of different methods and descriptions and ways of practicing. There are apps for it, but pick the thing that works for you. Find the person who presents the material as being someone you genuinely like. Um, and so make it something that you enjoy. But back to the, you know, the anxious thought patterns, worrying and decision making, um, you know, anxiety is ever present right now. I'm not somebody who generally deals with anxiety on a daily basis, but I'll say that I am seeing more anxiety in myself, um, you know, over the past few weeks. And so a lot of people um, who wouldn't normally be super anxious, they're anxious right now. But then here's the part that's kind of interesting. My very, very, very anxious clients are actually quite okay. They're, they're calm. They're, you know, they're, I thought that they would be a little bit more affected, but it's almost like they're saying, Hey, I was already living like this. You know, thanks for joining me. My world was already on fire. You know, (laughs) people who walk around with like extreme anxiety and PTSD, their world was already fucked up. Um, And so it's just like, Oh yeah, now you see it my way. Um, And then for people who've never really had to deal with that kind of thing, they're like, what is this feeling? Oh, it's anxiety. Um, but anxiety, everyone has anxiety. Anxiety is a part of life. It serves a purpose. It comes from the part of your brain called the amygdala and you're going to have adrenaline and cortisol at play there. And it's a truly physical thing. Um, and some people have anxiety. It makes them nauseous. They might sweat. The mouth goes dry or they'll get angry when they're anxious. Um, but it's truly more of a physical thing. Um, and it's coming from the uh, amygdala. But how to shift that is is to change the channel for your amygdala. So if you're playing Call of Duty and you're feeling angry, it's time to change the channel. Your amygdala is like, OK, enough. You know, I can't I can't watch us blow up one more. You know, I I just I need to break. So getting some sunshine, changing that up um, can be really super, super helpful for your anxiety and exercise is good for your anxiety as well. But just accept that in these times of uh, unprecedented social change, very quick change. Um, like fast and forced change that you are going to feel anxiety, Um, that that's just the way that things are right now. But the way we want to deal with that is by calming our amygdala. And you can Google that, calm my amygdala. And amygdala is spelled A-M-Y-G-A-L-A. 
and you can find out how to ground yourself and to soothe that part of your brain to bring those anxious thoughts down um, and cut them down to size. Now, worry is something different. Worry serves a purpose too. Worry, if we do it too much, it doesn't arm us. It harms us. But we, a lot of people, especially like, I don't know, I, I seem to recall like old ladies being like this, you know, like, <laughs> gotta worry, worry all yes. the time, and, you know, and everything is scary. And, um, and it's almost like they think people who worry a lot believe that if they worry enough about something that it somehow arms them against whatever it is. But that just flat out isn't true. What worry does is it gives us a signal that it's time to make a plan. And you make a plan and then you leave it alone. And now you've already set up what you're going to do in the event that, you know, such and such happens. So for example, I worry that, um, you know, I'm not getting to see my son as much um, and I'm missing him and I worry that, um, uh, I don't know that it's going to affect our relationship somehow that all this time apart, you know, won't be good for, for us. Well, I worry, I worry, I worry. So the plan is then I'm going to schedule some time probably in the fall where I've got two weeks of just me and him, you know, so there's the plan and it's done. So now I don't need to worry about that anymore. So worry tells us it's time to move those thoughts into our prefrontal cortex where we're logical, um, we're making plans um, and, and being rational, making uh, really good decisions. Um, and then we can we can do the thinking for ourselves ahead of time. It's sort of like writing a letter to your future self, like, OK, I see I'm worried about this, but I've already done some, you know, some things that might reduce the impact of it. And so I'm going to put this to bed. So make plans um, for the things that you're worrying about, if possible. Now, this is a catastrophe, right? Catastrophic thinking is part of having an anxiety disorder is that everything's a catastrophe. Well, we're living in a catastrophe, right? Yeah. So we can't even say to ourselves, it's not that big of a deal because it kind of is big, a big deal um, right now. Um, and just accept that and embrace it, that this is what's happening and it requires us to make these changes um, and that that's okay um, and that we're doing our duty in making those changes. Um, and then uh, the last part of that is with the decision making and decision making for me um, is is a lot simpler now than it used to be because I use these three questions. Is this healthy for me first? That's the first question. Is this healthy for me and the life that I'm trying to build, which life I'm trying to create for myself? Is it healthy? The second question is, is this healthy for my relationship or my marriage? That's the second one. Um, and the relationship that I'm trying to build with my partner is this healthy. And then the third one is, is this healthy for my family, my, my kids, my spouse or partner and myself. So you come first in that list. And there's a reason for that, especially for women. Um, and for a lot of men too, who will put other people before themselves. Um, when you're doing the decision-making, you want to you want to ask yourself first, is this a good thing for me? Um, and and that can help you with the decision making. Is this healthy? OK. Also, is it reasonable? Is it doable? You know, um, and just have a re do I have too high of expectations for myself on this? Um, and then you can wait. There's a lot of decisions that don't need to be made right now. You don't have to do a thing. And remember that doing nothing is doing something. And we're doing a lot of that right now. Yeah. If you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. <laughs> beep, beep, right. Um, well, that's outstanding. I do have a little bone to pick with you, though, because, you know, we've given a lot of advice here, but I never I haven't heard once you tell everyone to use drugs and alcohol to deal with all this. Well, that's a good that's a good topic. So. Alcohol seems like it's your friend. And I would say that to some degree it is. But I know about the brain and I know about neurobiology and how the brain affects us in our behaviors and in our mindset, um, in our moods. And alcohol is a depressant. 
and um, it's also just kind of bad for your body in general. I wouldn't say that, you know, to not drink. I would just say that try not to drink multiple days in a row if you can help it. Try to give your brain two days off, you know, so maybe drink a six pack or however much you like to drink um, one day, but then give your, give yourself a few days off from the drinking and try not to drink multiple days in a row, because that's when it really starts to saturate your system, um, and become a part of your body chemistry, where then your body then becomes more reliant on the substance, uh, especially alcohol. Um, a lot of people will be engaging in, um, herbal type medications during this time. Um, whether they are getting that legally or illegally. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with that as long as it's being done in a healthy way, as long as we're not exposing children, as long as you're not like that all the time, and as long as it's not keeping you from functioning. So we, let's not use those things to like put ourselves to sleep so that we don't have to experience the reality of our situation um, let's use it as a way of just kind of coming back to center from time to time when you need to. Um, but don't check out mentally because the people that love you and care about you need you. And we need you to be conscious and aware and present um, for us. So, um, yeah, that's a really great point. Some people are turning to substances and of course they are. Of course they are. It's supernatural and normal for that to happen. Um, just try to be aware of how it's affecting, affecting your brain and affecting your functioning. I also just want to let people know that if you have drugs or alcohol and they're in your home and you're worried and you're like, listen, I don't want to be tempted by these things. Um, <laughs> just, just direct message me and I'll send, you know, I'll take them off your hands. Okay. <laughs> I just, I will dispose of them in a healthy way. Um, <laughs> You know, I have been trained in these kinds of things. And so I just want to make sure that everyone's safe out there. So it's very important. Um, so uh, you can, you know, you guys know how to get a hold of me. So, uh, but, uh, but anyway, well, Mandy, are you ready to move on to our final topic here? Yeah. Last question. Let's okay. do it. So our last question comes to us from anonymous. It says, um, and it says a lot of people have hobbies, passions, and in some senses, their own ideas of Personal, personally belonging to anything has been taken away with the closures, cancellations, and postponing of social events. Is it important to find a replacement for these, or is it just better to wait it out? That's a really great question. So the way I'm interpreting that is we're talking about activities, places, people's thing, people and things that would give you purpose, you know, that it fuels your passion and that it's an investment for you, that it's you've been building on this um, and it makes you feel whole. It makes you feel like you have a reason to be here. Um, and especially as wrestlers, I would assume that, oh, my God, like everything's just been ripped away. And it's something that you've been investing in for a long time, for many years. And now you can't do the thing that you've been investing in and that you really, truly love. Um, and look forward to. And I would say that I've seen a lot of things that you guys have been doing where you're, um, you know, utilizing Facebook and other social media platforms to get creative um, so that you can still be investing in your purpose and in your passion. Um, and you have become resilient and you're able to adapt to this major change. Um, and so that's what you're doing. You're being resilient and you're adapting. But I definitely would not replace it because it's going to come back. Um, we will be um, going to wrestling, wrestling shows again. It might not be for a while, but I would say that your investment was worth it and that it's still um, it's still valuable. So you, it's not that we've thrown our time and energy away on something. It's just everyone has been given. I, I talk about a planned pause um, when, when we're talking about behavior change, navigating toxic and abusive people and decision making is the planned pause. Well, we've all just been forced into a forced pause. You know, we've just hit a pause button. 
Um, and so a lot of things will resume. So let's not let's not replace it. Let's just be resilient and creative in other ways that we can be investing. So, for example, maybe as a wrestler, you have mastered all the moves and won a bunch of belts. But do you know the history of wrestling? You know, like, do you know all the the famous names from the very beginning? Um, you know, there's other things about wrestling that you can learn and invest in reaching out to contacts um, to see, you know, about the future and your career um, and, and just talking, getting to know people that you haven't gotten to know yet. So you can still be networking. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can still be investing in it. Um, and then in terms of like something to be dedicated to and to have a passion about, yeah, you're right. I mean, maybe it is time to adopt some new things. We're not going to replace the old stuff. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? But you might want to start exploring some new things that might be good for you or that might be helpful to others that gives you purpose. So our mom started making masks. She was sewing masks on her sewing machine for people and we all got one and that's an example of somebody finding purpose to help others during a time like this so it could be something like there's an old lady that lives down the street by herself maybe you go and park your car outside of her house and play some music and be silly and make her laugh you know there's things nice things you can do for people that make you feel like you have purpose in terms of belonging especially with the wrestling community, I think it's pretty well established whether you belong or not. <laughs> Am I wrong about that? You know, wow. like I, I would depends. feel like that if, if, if you're even asking me these questions right now, you already belong. And it's just the thing that you belong to doesn't have a physical place, but it's still alive very much. So it's, it hasn't died. It's still there. It's just in a different form. And we have to be flexible and adapt to the new form. Um, and yeah, so wait. Yeah, wait. Don't replace things, but just try it in a different way. Be creative, be resilient, adapt, and then try some new things too. That maybe those things are temporary. My mom's not going to be sewing masks after this is all <laughs> over. You know, you may not be. Um, you know, doing some funny dance for an old lady six months from now, although maybe you will, maybe yeah, you'll really like what it is that you're doing. Um, you know, and then there's silly things like you can write letters to people, people that are incarcerated, people that are in, um, in the military, um, people in nursing homes, you know, there's, there's lots of people that are needing contact right now that aren't getting it at all that normally don't get it anyway. And now they're really not getting it. So, you know, one thing that can really make us feel good about ourselves and boost our self-esteem and our, our, our mental state is to help other people because it makes us feel better. There you go. Well, that's some awesome advice. Um, here's what I'm thinking. So you have some resources that you'd like to kind of help distribute to folks. So what I'm thinking is, is that maybe, um, you know, those kinds of things you can send to me and I can include into the show notes or I can share those separately from the the uh, the um, episode itself. But there's going to be some resources out there for you, some YouTube videos that we want you to watch if you're interested. So, you know, just pay attention to the social media for that. And we're on Facebook at the Road Home FW and, you know, we're uh, – we're uh, on Twitter at the same thing and, and also at, uh, you know, on Instagram. Won't be posting any of those videos on Instagram. But uh, anyway, well, well um, the mm. other thing I'd like to say is that I do have a Facebook page and it's um, Mandy Friedman, F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N, L-P-C-C. And on that page, there's so many videos, lots of videos. Um, and then I also have a YouTube channel under the same name. And there's lots of videos there, too. Uh, some of the videos are specific to my specialty of um, abuse, abusive relationships and survivors of abuse. But 
a lot of that information applies to everyone too. So just because it says the word survivor, that's what we mean by survivor, someone who has survived abuse, don't let that stop you from watching the video. You're going to learn something, and a lot of what is said can be applied to a number of different scenarios. So check out those videos on my Facebook page and on YouTube. There you go, folks. I hope this was helpful to someone, and if it helped one person, then it was worth it. And, uh, you know, if you guys are out there and you're having problems and you want to talk, you can always reach out to me. Um, you know, uh, it's just I'm here. You know, we're, we're here to help folks. And, and that's what the Road Home from Wrestling is all about. So, uh, you know, I was talking to Mandy about some of the mental health issues that my friends are facing. And we decided to go ahead and address some of those. So I appreciate everybody's help with this episode. And um, is there anything else you'd like to add, Mandy? I don't think so, but I would say the same, and that is that if you really do need to talk to someone and you're having a hard time, um, you know, you if you reach out to Andy and um, you need help, I can also help you um, and refer you to someone um, professionally speaking. Um, so please don't feel like that you're ever all by yourself or alone because you're not. We're right here and my whole entire job right now is to be doing those sorts of things. So you, you wouldn't be bothering us or bothering me um, to reach out and say I'm really not doing well. Um, and then we'll figure it out. Emotions have power and, uh, and thoughts and things like that. They have power. And when you leave them inside of you, especially if they're negative emotions, they eat away at you. So you have to get them out. And, uh, you know, that's why one of many, many reasons why therapy is useful and why it works no matter who you are. And uh, it's that thing where you know, you do get off work and you had a bad day and you got a chance to talk to your friend about it and you feel better afterwards. Imagine. Just, yeah. Oh, Sorry. I was just going to say, imagine, you know, having someone who's professionally trained to make you feel that way. And that's what that is. You know. Yeah. You just made a statement, though, and that was that therapy would work for anyone. I can think of one person that I don't think it'll work for. Uh, who, who? Somebody who is 22 years old. Oh, why? Jay Donaldson? Why? Yeah, I don't know if therapy's going to work for Jay Donaldson. He's, he's beyond help? Is that the problem? He might be a lost cause. He's so delusional. Um, <laughs> I, you know... I, you could be right. I don't know. Jay Donaldson, <laughs> local wrestler here, who's been claiming that he's 22 for several years now. Um, and uh, that is not true. And, you know, the other thing, too, is he really he's had a change of heart recently, Mandy. And I, I, can't, heard. I cannot wait for you to see him again, because he may come out and say hi to you and give you a high five and say, come on. And he may say, yeah. So we don't know. You know, well, it's, it's it's exciting. I'm simultaneously like excited and disappointed, <laughs> but that must be what it's like to be, you know, around Jay in general. Anyhow, <laughs> you, could, you could be right. You could be right. Well, <laughs> well I hope you guys enjoyed this um, and, you know, I hope it was beneficial. Please uh, listen to this many times. There was a lot of information in there. Um, you know, go back with a uh, notebook and, and uh, take down some notes, for, especially from that first section where Mandy was really breaking down uh, a lot of the languages of love and all the kind of di different things like that. That was really good stuff. So, well, Mandy, I love you. I hope you're OK. And I'm really glad that we're able to do stuff like this together. And if there's one thing that the road home from wrestling has done. It's uh, it's we were already really close, but this podcast has brought us even closer and I'm so glad you're a part of it. And if it weren't for you, my mental health uh, would, I mean, my physical health is top notch, obviously sure, my, sure. my mental health, you know, wouldn't be what it is today. I wouldn't <laughs> feel like I could handle a thing like a pandemic, you know, but I do, you know, so, and that's because of you and, and, and because of the strength that our family gives each other. So, mm -hmm. Well, I love you, too, and I really appreciate you bringing me on to do this. Um, it's been fun, and, you know, we can do it again. All right, folks, thank you so much for listening. You're welcome.